Father, we do ask that you would speak to your church. Thank you that you have, through your Spirit, moved the apostles and prophets to pen that which is inspired, finding its source in you. It is inerrant. Not a single error from cover to cover. It's authoritative over our lives and absolutely sufficient answering the issues of life. And so, Lord, as we continue to anchor our lives in the bedrock of your truth, would you convict us of that horrible vice of pride that we'll be fighting every day until Jesus comes again or calls us home? And through the gospel and the indwelling spirit, would you continue to foster a gospel humility in our lives? We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Let me invite you to take your copy of God's Word and join me in Mark chapter 14. In Mark chapter 14, verses 26 to 31, I would like to preach to a sermon that I've entitled Promised Defection. There is an outline on the back of your bulletin as usual. Now, for those using the five-day-a-week Bible reading plan, you don't have to use it, but you better have some plan for getting through Scripture uh, rather than just throwing your Bible open every day and, well, where am I going to read today? There ought to be an intentionality. But if you're on that five-day plan that we've been using for a couple of years, tomorrow's reading includes 1 Samuel 18. And in 1 Samuel 18, he's recounting the tender friendship and deep loyalty of David and Jonathan, one of the special friendships that we read of in Holy Writ. This is right after David's brave slaying of Goliath. And in 1 Samuel 18, these are the words. It came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him, gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. And Saul set him over the men of war, and it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. It happened as they were coming when David returned from killing the Philistine that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines with joy and the musical instruments. Remember the refrain? Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Him who had slaughtered Goliath and impressed Saul and went about warring for Saul. He's a hero. It didn't take long for Saul to become jealous when those women were singing that Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. It didn't take long for that wounded ego to get the best of Saul as he became angry. Remember what James has to remind us about anger, that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, James 1.20. David was quickly dismissed and demoted in Saul's heart and mind from hero to enemy. Nothing instructs us in anthropology and that why man does what he does like the scriptures. And we learn so much from this account and others. Godly biblical friendship, deep gospel friends, is an important doctrine in scripture especially as it pertains to body life in the church and even the part that it plays in our own sanctification. Recall what the preacher said in Ecclesiastes 4, that a cord of three strings is not easily broken. We got a bulletin insert, kind of given a rehash of the booklet, uh, the new booklet in the book nook. Read it. Discuss it. Implement it into your life. Go back to our thematic study of the book of Proverbs and look at that lesson on biblical friendship. What to avoid 
in would-be friends and what to incorporate in our own lives to be those kind of friends that God's called us to be. In our text of Mark 14, we're coming out of the Upper Room Discourse, the Last Supper, where Jesus had just stated, here he is reclining around the table with his 12 disciples, and he said, one of you 12 is a devil. One of you who dipped his sop with me, and that little side dish was shared three or four people at a time. There's a, you know, a betrayer of the worst sort. Not from outside, but from inside. You know, back in Psalm 41, let these words of David percolate in your mind as to what would have been percolating in their hearts and minds when Jesus said that, that last night. In Psalm 41, beginning in verse 5, you know, my enemies speak evil against me. When will he die and his name perish? You have been there uh, with those that have betrayed you. Uh, David was there. When he comes to see me, he speaks falsehood. His heart gathers wickedness to itself. When he goes outside, he tells it. All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt, saying, A wicked thing is poured out upon him, that when he lies down, he will not rise up again. Even my close friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you are pleased with me because my enemy does not shout in triumph over me. As for me, you uphold me in my integrity and you set me in your presence forever. Study the Psalms, beloved. Because the Psalms teach us how to pour our soul out to the Lord, how to run to the true friend, the Lord. Because when our eyes are kind of man-centered, set, set horizontally, we're all going to fail each other. But there's one who faileth never. And so, yes, this was a messianic prophecy of what would take place that evening. Jesus is told of the betrayal of Judas, but then he continues on in our account today to tell us that it's not just one. The rest are going to fall away. Add insult to injury. Though not permanently, they would still be disloyal. In the hour that Jesus most needed his followers it was agonizing in Gethsemane. They're walking from the upper room to Gethsemane. And Jesus says that it's not just one, but you, the rest of you are going to fall away. And you'd think that by the time they walk over the Kidron Valley to Gethsemane, they'd be alert so that when he says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation, they would watch and pray not into temptation. Pat in the obvious to the casual observer. And yet they were a snooze. Friends, we need to factor into our biblical worldview in this troubled, fallen world that betrayal is part of life. It's part of life. This world is broken. God has not given us the option to quit and to let up on intentionally pouring into others in discipleship and service with the saints. You know, when, when Jesus had Judas betray him and the rest of the, of the 11 fall away, thank God that the God-man is not just a man and acting like we do when we just want to pound a flash and we want to tuck our tail and run. After the glorious resurrection, he goes to the seashore, according to John 21, and restores Peter to ministry who becomes the powerful preacher in the first chapters of Acts. Peter finally got it. So we need to factor this into our biblical worldview. There's so much in the text today that we, we can't give an exhaustive 
uh, exegesis of, there's disloyalty, there's this fair weather, fickle friendship that we experience in this fallen world, betrayal, lack of commitment, pride, overconfidence, it's all in there. Just like that ragu sauce in your cabinet. It's in there, if you remember the old commercial. So let's do something a little different uh, in our outline of the text. Let's hang each verse on a word. And then after we see man's weakness and failure, how that Jesus is the premier fulfillment. That no matter what friends fail us on this planet, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Jesus is the premier fulfillment for human friends are eventually going to fail us, but Jesus never. Beloved, grow in your love and your allegiance to the friend of sinners, which was a phrase of derision from Jesus' enemies, but to us who are saved and brought near into intimate fellowship, it's a precious gospel reality that God would find favor with the likes of redeemed sinners, bearing much privilege yet responsibility. Mark 14, beginning in verse number 26. Follow along as I read for us. John Mark tells us, After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. Now, notice, this is a quotation. What the Scriptures have said will come to pass. This betrayal, this falling away, it was foretold. But after I've been raised, Jesus says, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all were saying the same thing also. Denial, no. Death, I'll take. Right. Our first word in our outline is transition. Verse 26 is a transitional verse. It marks the end of the upper room discourse, which we mentioned John takes up five chapters telling us about all the teaching that Jesus did. Mark just gives us a snippet. So the end of the upper room discourse and leads to the scene in the garden. And he, John Mark tells us that after singing a hymn, they broke up that supper. And we actually know what it is. Uh, to have a Passover Seder, a, a Passover meal together, you would end it with the Hallel which is Psalms 139 to 118, sung at the close of that Passover meal that they just shared. It would have been the second half, chapters uh, Psalm 116 to 18. You know what I was intrigued by is those some of the last words of Psalm 118. And in Psalm 118, here's what they were singing. I shall give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. That psalm was the last song on the lips of Jesus as he and his disciples, 11 left at this time, are marching out of the upper room. Before he departs for Gethsemane, ultimately Golgotha, the Messiah who would be rejected singing about the stone which the builders rejected. He knew it all. You know, at some point in the notes i got it ahead here aren't you glad for god's grace and withholding a lot of the uh future devastations that we have that god has planned for us in life and yet jesus knew in advance what was going to go on 
and he is singing with his disciples this song. So they're leaving the, the uh, Passover turned into the Lord's Supper to the Mount of Olives. Gethsemane lay across the brook Kidron, low on the western slope of the Mount of Olives. And on this walk is the revelation of the falling away, verses 26 to 31. And then Mark will describe the agony in the garden, verses 32 to 42. Tells of the betrayal and arrest, 43 to 50. And finally, the young man who fled in verses 51 and 52. So verse 26 is a transition. Word two is prediction. Notice verse 27 again. After singing, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. You will all fall away. You know, this prediction is not like the weatherman who might be right and might be wrong. When Jesus says something, you can count on it. Biblical prophecy is that way. It comes about how the Lord says. There's a proverb of our day that goes that to be forewarned is to be for arm. And you'd think the disciples, just with good common sense, would understand as Jesus is saying you're going to fall away, that they would be aware so that they not fall away. This warning of Peter's denial is recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. While Luke and John focus on Peter, Matthew and Mark through their eyes, we see that Jesus directed it to all the disciples. Even though impulsive Peter acts as the spokesman of foolishness, he's not the only one. He just speaks for what the brothers don't have the guts enough to say themselves. So this prediction that you will all fall away. Jesus frequently warned of offenses. And this is to all of them without exception. The term is scandalizo, literally to be scandalized, to be offended, or to stumble. There's a lot of offenses that take place in life. The verb has the basic idea of being caught in a trap. Back in chapter 4, verse 17, when Jesus was telling parables, this was the parable of the rocky soil, that there are those who immediately receive the gospel of the kingdom, and it seems like there's new life in Christ. But there's no for, firm root. This life is temporary. Because when affliction or persecution comes, they are offended. I thought signing up to serve Jesus was going to be make life a, a rose garden. Really? Not necessarily. And they just fall away. A true believer can fall. A true believer can fall hard, but will not fall indefinitely or permanently. Judas fell all the way permanently. And though these guys would stumble, they'd be restored. Jesus says you're going to fall away. Not that they would feel offense at Jesus personally, but they're going to get caught up by that which would happen that night. They're totally unprepared. They're not, uh, they're not uh, watching. They're sleeping. It would stagger their faith and shake their confidence in Him as Messiah. It would challenge their loyalty to Him. So when Jesus predicts and he says, you are going to fall away, this isn't new news to him. Three years ago when he called the man, he knew that this night was coming. He knew they'd turn on him and fall away. And like I'd said earlier, perhaps part of God's kind grace to us is not revealing heartache in advance. But Jesus foresaw all of it. And he still continued to mentor these guys because they were going to continue his ministry when he ascended to the Father. So when it comes to them being scandalized or falling away, friends, we need to understand words have range of meaning. 
and what is a given author's take? What is, what is the authorly intent and in how he uses words? You know, one of the, one secondary meaning of this word was used back in chapter 9, where Jesus warned his disciples that if you cause a fellow disciple to sin, it would be better to have a millstone hung about your neck and drowned. Drowning was the worst thing in the mind of a Jew. It'd be better for that to happen than to cause offense of a fellow child of God, to lead them into sin. But here Mark is using the first and more general meaning of offense and being vexed. It takes on kind of a passive sense in that the external factors will act upon them and cause them to do this. This is nothing like, they weren't strategizing like Judas was. They weren't doing that. It's more of a lapse than an egregious rebellion. Jesus has been preparing them on the way for this so that they not be caught off guard. They were to guard as all of us disciples are to guard and be on the lookout. Sins of weakness, sins of hesitancy and indecisiveness and double-mindedness rather than Judas's intentional high-handed sin. Their falling away is a bit different. Friends, do you have a plan in your sanctification on how to prepare for those things that we have no idea what's coming down the pipe, like they didn't know? As you war against indwelling sin and seek to be watchful and sober, not snoozing, that you're aware of Satan's schemes and our own total depravity, or as the old hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Jesus says, you will all, every and each one of you, fall away. Because it's written. Hati gagraptai. Jesus quotes Zechariah 13, 7. His prediction grounded in the scriptures, the incarnate word taking them back to the written word. The written divine authority of the prophet Zechariah added to Jesus' innate verbal authority in his admonition. Here was the prophecy of the martyrdom of the eschatological good shepherd that Zechariah spoke about. And Jesus actually changes. When I said that he quotes Zechariah, it's almost verbatim quote except for that personal pronoun, I. I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. Jesus saw his coming sufferings, not just as inflicted by men, even though there is a human component. When, you, when people bring up the argument and question you, okay, so he'll, who killed Jesus? The Romans? The Jews, well, how about we understand a whole biblical theology that it pleased the Father to bruise the Son, Isaiah 53. God killed His Son. Gave Him death so that He might give us life through Him. In some proper sense, this is inflicted by God Himself. The shepherd would not be smitten contrary to divine providence, even though man's got his sinful mitts in the process. He's thinking of his own death in the spirit of Isaiah 53. The picture of the suffering servant of Yahweh, that it pleased the father to bruise the son in fulfillment of his will. He repeats the paradox that we've already looked at back in verse 21 where evil is used by God to fulfill his greater purpose. The back in verse 21, the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man whom the Son of Man has betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. So while Judas has to own his sin and rebellion, it's not that 
Judas can undo the perfect plan of God that's going off just fine without a hitch. Jesus understood his sufferings in the Passion, that it's ordained by God. Isaiah 53.10, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. You know, and that consolation will continue in our next point of the sermon. But there's just no way to soften the blow and the bitterness that they will be scattered. His arrest, his trial, his death will leave the sheep utterly bewildered, scattering them in every direction. Matter of fact, if you were to get a sneak peek down in verse 50, when John Mark says, and they all left him and fled. I mean, just feel the pain and the agony of your closest friends gone. No commitment. That's why we've got to hasten to the next word. Our third is promise. Verse 28. But after I've been raised, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee. Against the bleak darkness forecast is this glimmering promise of resurrection and rendezvous in Galilee. This is not just news, it is good news. But after I've been raised, strongly contrast the darkness of his death with the light of his resurrection. And dear friends, how often we put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Right? We are always talking about the death of Christ for sinners and leaving out the glory of the resurrection. They go together. These are twin doctrines that have to be preached together. You're a little grammatical note here in this promise that this is the passive voice in Greek. You say, well, I don't care what that means to us. Well, it's pointing to the Father as the agent. Thus, the God who will smite the shepherd will also raise him from the dead. Man's got his heinous sin, his sinful myths involved in all of this, and yet God is working it all together for his good and glory. As was his habit, Jesus seldom spoke of his death without also including his resurrection. Remember when they're walking up to Jerusalem, and three times he tells them, we're going up to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to die, and what? I'm going to rise again. Death and resurrection. Might we include these twin doctrines? In this note of promise, after I have been raised, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead to Galilee. I'll wait for you there. That term, go ahead, lead the way, precede. Because it was there that he would regather and resume leadership of his sheep. Again, talking about sneak peeks over in chapter 16, which I think was our Resurrection Sunday reading. In Mark 16, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They're saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen, and he is not here. Behold, here is the place where they lay him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you. That's what Jesus just said to us in chapter 14. Going ahead of you to Galilee, there you will see him, just as he told you. You know, so this young man, probably a, an angel, is, come on, don't you guys get it? Hello, he's already told you this, and he's already there. The kingdom he brings and embodies cannot be scuttled by human failure. He who first called his apostolic band of brothers at the Sea of Galilee back in chapter 1, verse 16, three years before, will again call and assemble and reestablish them at the Sea of Galilee, chapter 16, verse 7. All part of his glorious story. 
There is promise. Not to lose heart like they did in just a few hours. Word number four is pride. Notice verse 29. Another but. Contrast. But Peter said to him, even though all fall away, yet I will not. Are you, are, you, are you reading that like I am? Like, Peter, what does all mean? Though everyone falls away, I'm not going to be part of the everyone. Do you not see this, this pride? Maurice Roberts wrote a wonderful God-centered book entitled The Thought of God to just blow the circuit breakers in our mind of the greatness and majesty of God. Regarding pride, Mr. Roberts says this, no serpent suns himself more proudly than fallen men in the warmth of his own importance. This tendency is in every Christian, even the best. Peter, you are no exception to the rule. All is all, all me. Get over yourself. Jesus' announcement to the group was followed by impulsive Peter's response, a quick repudiation, like, like he's often done correcting his Lord. In fact, each prediction Jesus gives of his passion in Mark, the disciples respond with self-assertion and conceit rather than humility. You know, he's going up say, saying that, that when we get up there, I'm going to die, and they're arguing with each other, okay, Lord, who's going to be to your right and to your left in your kingdom? Because we're the big deal, not you. They say, well, we didn't say that. It's all semantics. The audacity of Peter thinking he needed to, or even had the right to amend our sovereign Lord's words. His words here are only slightly less rude than his rebuke after that first prediction in chapter 8, verse 32. Peter offers just one exception. See how subtle this is. Even though all fall away. So he's at least listening to this and agreeing with Jesus on this first part of his statement. But what a dig to his fellow disciples. His insinuation was insulting. You know how we've said before that uh, we see other people's sins in 2020 vision. Go to Matthew 7 verses 1 to 5 sometime. We can see the speck in their eye and ignore the whole log in our own eye. Two people in the same room, who's the bigger sinner? Well, the humble one says, I am. I'm the biggest sinner. Though we love the Lord, his protest reveals his sad ignorance of his own weakness. He sees himself as an exception to the rule. Where others fall, he'll stand. So he's got to castigate them to make himself look so much better. He said, even though all fall away, I will not. Here's his boasted loyalty. I'll be here. Nothing will separate us. I'll be your most ardent supporter. Yeah, until you won't. And with this prideful boast, he arrogantly elevates himself above the others. Because again, you've got to castigate your opponent, to make yourself look so great. And while it exhibits self-sufficiency and self-reliance, it's an arrogant statement of his own strength in comparison with them. His own brethren and associates in the apostolic office, like you were picked because of your brains and brawn, Peter, as opposed to fellow fishermen. It could even be this scene that Jesus points back to in John 21 after the resurrection when he restores Peter at the seashore and he says to Peter, do you love me more than these? You know, these that you castigated who were such great sinners to fall away. Peter, just be honest. And brethren, how aware are you of your own prideful overconfidence? that drives you in desperation to the Lord to reveal all the hidden sins of our pride manifest in a multitude of ways. Well, Luke 
helps peel back our human ignorance to the unseen realm in human relationships. And without minimizing our own sinful heart, our own fleshiness that we alone are responsible for, in other words, we're not helpless victims for our sin, he reports Jesus' warning to Peter in Luke 22 that Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. He didn't know that until Jesus told him that. That detail underscores even more starkly the spiritual danger of the hour. Now, keep your finger in our text and run over to Galatians 6, if you would, as we think about this overconfidence in the flesh. And if there's any pregnant passage full of explaining to us our hidden fleshiness and our over-reliance on our own abilities, it would be Galatians. Galatians 6, the arm of flesh is going to fail us every time. Galatians 6, verse number 3. Paul says, if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he'll have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load, for the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. You're back in the previous chapter of Galatians. You see the works of the flesh and the, 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 host, the whole laundry list of sins that the flesh can accomplish in contrast to the fruit of the Spirit's work in the life of the believer and what he accomplishes as we give ourselves to him. Arm of flesh is going to fail you every time. Peter learned the lesson. Go back to our text. Fifth word is denial. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. Truly I say, the, the, the undergirding word here is what we use a lot, amen. Jesus gives a hearty amen to his own statement. This very night before the rooster crows twice, this is his solemn note of certainty. He singles out Peter that his failure would be greater than that of the rest. This very night, in just a few hours, we're late. We're, we're like 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. Not going to be long before the rooster crows. And he points his finger to Peter and says, by the second cock crow, second cock crow was connected with the dawn of the rising sun. It was the third of four watches of the night. It's between 12 and 3 a.m. called cock crowing. Think about what it must have been like when Peter heard that first cock crow. At that moment, there hasn't been two, and it was still a period where he could get right and not do the dastardly deed if he really took Jesus' word seriously. Truly I say this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny. Peter had singled himself out as the one who would remain faithful amid the general defection, and yet Jesus singles him out to inform him he'd not only desert, but actually deny his master. Mark alone mentions the cock crowing twice, and as we exert a little sanctified speculation, why? Well, it's probably as Peter was relaying his experience to John Mark, his vivid recollection of the events, because when that first crow came, he's already thinking about what his Lord said, and he could have gone the right way and didn't. Deny is a strong compound form, meaning deny utterly, refuse to recognize or acknowledge, which is what takes place in verse 72. Threefold denial is not just a momentary slip of weakness. And how quickly the most notable convictions can wilt before a serious onslaught. I'm reminded of Luther's polemic in the bondage of the will. That the human will and human knowledge, though the most notable of characteristics, are ultimately fickle and blind 
and inclined to evil. Don't think too high or too low. Think accurately, Paul talks about. Everything we know, everything we say, everything we do is corrupted by sin. It's what the Bible teaches us about total depravity. Not that every man fully demonstrates the nth degree of his sin, but everything in our experience is tainted. What we say, what we think, what we do. One scholar said it's of no use to protest that we have not committed the sins we self-righteously condemn in others. The question is not what sins we have committed as much as what sins we would commit were we faced with serious pressure, temptation, opportunity, and threat. You know, Peter said, I, I'll die to you. That's a give, uh, die for you. That's a given. But, well, Peter, are you willing to live for him and these experiences, which are rough, which are tenuous? Again, first caught crow, there was yet time to be strong in the Lord, but he was not. And so we see that final word in verse 31 of overconfidence. Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I won't deny you. And they were all saying the same thing also. I think that this becomes the teaching point as soon as we get over in the garden. To be watchful in prayer, lest we enter into the same kind of temptation. Peter kind of raises his protest to another octave here. He didn't recognize his pride. Do you realize your pride? Uh, a lady once told Charles Spurgeon, I pray for you every day that you might not become proud. Spurgeon responded, You put me in mind of my own neglect, for I have never prayed that prayer for you and must begin. Oh no, the lady protested. There is no occasion for that. There is no danger of my being proud. Spurgeon replied, Then I had better begin at once, for you are proud already. Beloved, please notice the blinding nature of pride. Only elicited more vehement and passionate protest in his heart and lips. Such claims are more easily made in our ease and our safety than when we're in that crucible of temptation and opposition. You know, as we pray for the persecuted church, well, it's great when we're not being persecuted. How devoted are we to, to righteousness when we're in that same situation? Easy to grandstand and say flamboyant things compared to what you think will never occur. Like in this case, Peter's case was dying. It's much harder to live for him in daily denial of self, crucifying afresh the flesh. I guess the question is, are we faithfully and daily doing that? And even weekly. In that upper room, according to John's recollection, in John 13, 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I would lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Peter was deluded in his pride. Are you willing to lay down personal desires, the sword of personal vendettas, your own desires and likes, be a nobody and keeping your nose to the grindstone without recognition? Simply that your master says, well done, thou faithful servant. Not when it's convenient, but when it's sacrificial. And yet Peter kept saying insistently, the term there, ek perisos, isn't found anywhere in classical Greek, nowhere in the Greek Septuagint. Mark basically coins his own term here. It means beyond measure, exceedingly or vehemently. A strong adverb only in Mark. In, John Mark's trying to help us see that Peter's very animated in his denial, in this overconfidence. He's all in. 
if I should die with thee, even implying his expectancy. Again, now was not the time to die. It was coming, but not now. Jesus wasn't calling for death of some valiant bodyguard cut down in a heroic last stand, but for one willing to take up his cross and put to death his own selfish ambition, his self-centered purpose, no matter how noble it might appear on the surface. And his double negative, not deny, just uh, compounded. The mere thought was repulsive, and yet he would do it. One uh, New Testament scholar said in his vehemence, he does not see that he is charging Christ with uttering false predictions. Jesus says this is what you're going to do. He says, no way, Jose, it ain't going to happen. Notice that Peter wasn't alone in the boasting, though. John, John Mark tells us they were all saying the same thing. They're nodding their heads. Though Peter was impulsive and his denial lives on in infamy, his self-confident position was approved and accepted by the other brothers. So when time comes for bravado, each of the disciples manages to speak for himself so for John Mark, this was no guilt by association or corporate victimization by your spokesperson. They all drank the cup, verse 23. They all confessed their allegiance in verse 31. And yet in verse 50, they all flee. Since the disciples are painted with all their ugly sin warts and all, But Mark would include this is another instance in the Gospels where since Peter and the other apostles are not spared, this is a trustworthy account. Because if you and I were penning it, we'd kind of erase the ugliness. So Jesus predicts what surely came to pass. Friends, are you living close to your Lord in daily worship? cultivating deep gospel friendships in the body, knowing that we're going to offend each other and we just going to need to get over ourselves and get on about the Lord's business. You know, as we focus on Jesus and come around his table, they're just leaving the upper room. And he said there that I won't partake of the table again until my kingdom. The expectation in spite of cowardice and treachery of his followers, the impending agony of the cross was this expectation of the coming kingdom. But that hasn't come yet. You and I live at that gap between his first and his second coming. We're going to have treacherous relationships. As a matter of fact, we'll contribute plenty of treachery to those relationships. Disloyalty, fickle friends, lack of commitment, but what about Jesus? And as you seek to lean into his example and put on the Lord Jesus to make no provision for the flesh, we got the bleak backdrop of the disciples' ignorance, their cowardice, their weakness, their pride, all serving to highlight Jesus' contrasting greatness, his majestic character. Let me highlight just four of them and we will pray and go into the Lord's table. How about his knowledge? Jesus' knowledge. While they're ignorant and doubting, he exhibits supernatural knowledge and unwavering certainty at all times in the face of suffering. Being God, he possessed the knowledge of Judas and could say that night at supper, one of you who dipped his sop in the dish with me will betray. And he could prophesy and predict and tell them with all certainty they're all going to fall away. Unlike Judas, their defection would only be temporary. He had a full understanding of the Father's will. Though there'd be arrest and desertion, he would not shrink back from the Father's plan. He's going to go all the way. Add to his knowledge his courage. He cited the tragic prediction from the prophet Zechariah of what was written. I will strike down the shepherd, applying those words to himself 
even their failings would not overturn the sovereign purposes of God and the sure promises of Scripture. You see how you know, this, these were foretold hundreds of years before Jesus. And they brought comfort and hope as they do us, embolden us like they did Jesus. His courage contrasts with their cowardice. So we've got Jesus' knowledge, his courage. How about his power? He looked beyond the cross to his glorious resurrection, talking about his death and his resurrection, assuring them that their scattering would not be permanent. Though they fall, they won't fall headlong permanently. They'd abandon him in just a few hours, but he would gather them again once raised from the dead when he meets them in Galilee. And from there, he would commission his apostles, Matthew 28, say all power and authority is given to me and sends them out to go and make disciples of all nations. Fourth and finally, how about his humility? Regardless of what the teacher and authoritative and inerrant Lord told Peter in this prediction, Peter in his overconfidence brashly declared his courage would never fail. I'll be with you to the end, Lord. Oblivious to the fact that Satan had demanded permission to sift, much like he did to Job in being tempted to curse God and die. Peter's pride is set against our Lord's meekness. You see his knowledge, his courage, his power, his humility. And might he add those to our pursuit of him as a favor. Father, thank you for your own beloved son whom you brought to the cross, who laid his life down only to take it up again, to be gloriously resurrected, to ascend to your right hand, and it's today make an intercession for us. And we pray that as our Savior prays for us and our stability and our honor of him, that we would be growing in our love of the preciousness of Christ who knows all things, who was courageous, who exhibited his power. Might we know that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength to the daily battle. And as you are meek and mild, make us humble in our dependence upon you for your grace. And we talk us to give you all the praise in your son's name. Amen. Well, I'd ask the men to come and hand out the elements and if you're